All right, wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Helen, for wherever she is. There she is, for kicking us off, giving us the big idea in the overview. Um, I'm Rebecca Winthrop. Um, I'm the co-director here, as Helen said, with the Center for Universal Education. Um, you will soon, in the next panel, hear from my co-conspirator, partner in crime, Jennifer Vey, who directs the Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. Um, very uh, delighted to have uh, join us today uh, Greg Baer, um, who's the executive director of the Grable Foundation, uh, Joan Lombardi, um, who is, uh, her title here is Director um, of Early Opportunities, but I must say she has a very long career with many other titles that are not featured here, um, including um, a distinguished career at the U.S. Um, Health and Human Services Department, leading early childhood for the nation, and working with many different um, initiatives and foundations on this topic. And last but not least, the sort of mother of playful learning landscapes, if I can um, say that, Kathy, uh, is Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, who we're very lucky to have with us here at Brookings as a senior fellow, um, but also as a professor at uh, Temple University. So thank you all for being here. Um, and Kathy, um, I wanted to start with you. Um, because a lot of what we've had conversations about in terms of big picture things that we care about at the Center for Universal Education um, is thinking about, you know, are we preparing our young people for the world they will enter as adults? Are we preparing them for the labor market? Where are we preparing them to be good citizens? Are we preparing them to thrive in their personal lives? Um, and we certainly know um, from lots and lots of literature that the one thing we absolutely have to do is give young people a broad set of competencies and skills. They do need strong academic knowledge, but they absolutely need strong, call whatever term you want. Some people talk about 21st century skills. Some people talk about social emotional learning. We have a list of actually 300 terms, transversal skills, transferable skills, etc. But I won't give them all. The point is young people need um, to uh, have strong um, analytical experience and strong knowledge. And then they need to know how to learn new things over the, the course of their life. They need to know how to work with other people, think, think critically, have empathy for others. Um, and this is something that we talk about as sort of the breadth of skills. And it's certainly something we work a lot on um, at Brookings within education systems, um, talking to education systems how they can um, deliver a breadth of skills to students more effectively. Um, and employers are asking for it on and on with the rising age of automation. We know that 50 to 70 percent of job tasks, so within jobs, tasks, a lot of tasks will be automated, and everybody um, will need to do a lot, have a lot more higher order thinking skills, um, whether it's a ma manual job or a, or a sort of cognitive job. So that's something that's really important, and education systems have to grapple with. But we know from what Helen talked about, that the gap is so huge and the pace of change is so lo long and slow that we absolutely have to find any good idea out there that we haven't yet tapped to try to advance um, closing this gap. In the, in the US, um, the pace of change is so slow between rich kids and poor kids. It's about, on average, 126 years for poor kids to catch up with rich kids in the United States. It's going to take 126 years for just basic school readiness indicators. And, you know, so we, we've got an urgent crisis on our hand. Um, and this is part of why we are really excited about this idea of um, unlikely allies between the placemaking and urban planning community and the, and the early childhood development community. Um, and so one of the things, Kathy, I wanted to start with you on, you... Um, in the presentation, Helen featured much of your research and much of the sort of installations that you've been experimenting and playing with for years to see are there other ways um, for us to sort of um, uh, nudge the type of um, caregiver-child interaction we know is really crucial. Um, and I wanted, um, I wanted you to talk just a little bit about two things and explain to the audience why Playful Learning Landscapes works. So from a child developmental psychologist, one is this idea of play. Like what, I'm not a play specialist, and I've, I, what I have determined, there's no one definition of play that they all agree on, but 
that there is a continuum of play that everyone agrees on. On one side, there's free play, kids just going out in the street, playing around, doing whatever they want. On the other end of the spectrum is very structured games. And somewhere in the middle is guided play, which is where playful learning landscape sits. Tell us about why is guided play so important for helping close this big gap? Sure. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I also just want to point out that my partner in crime, Roberta Golenkoff, is here in the audience today, and we've done everything together for like 40 years, so uh, she needs to be acknowledged too. Um, so what I think we've learned in the science are several key foundations. Uh, the first foundation is that we're getting a much better handle on how human beings learn. And they learn, you could even put this in a tweet, right? They learn when they're doing something active, when they're engaged, not distracted, when something's meaningful rather than disjointed, when it's socially interactive, and believe it or not, when it's joyful. Now, let's try to figure out what in the world includes those features. And it turned out that much of what we were doing in school was the antithesis of active, engaged, meaningful, socially interactive, and joyful. So how did we turn that around? And the other thing that we realized is that there really are a suite of skills that you need. We went down a rabbit hole. And the rabbit hole was kind of, oh my gosh, we better make sure that kids just do well, and notice the just there, in their math outcomes when we give them a standardized test. We don't even really know sometimes what we're testing. And, um, and when we give them a math test. So the question that we had to ask ourselves is, what do, you, what do you really call success as a society? And what are those suite of skills? And what we figured out at some point from, again, the evidence-based point of view, is that a lot of the suite of skills appears in the sandbox and takes you all the way to the boardroom. Now the question is, how do you best deliver that? And one thought in early education was that the best way to deliver it was let the kids play. And so you ended up with this war going on between the play schools and the direct instruction sometimes known by the other camp as drill and kill, where the play group was called the superfluous group or the just play group. All right. So as we looked at the evidence, we thought, my gosh, there has to be another way. There has to be a way that we can offer rich curricular goals and at the same time do so with a pedagogical approach that is active and engaged, meaningful, socially interactive, and joyful. Ta-da! So we looked at the continuum of play, and instead of just talking about go out into the playground and you will come back as a reader, we thought it might be a better idea to have a learning goal in mind uh, whether it's the museum type where you structure an environment where the kids kind of fall into with their parents, notice the two gen here, where they fall into doing things that are going to support that, or be the guide on the side where you're kind of prompting and nudging on the side. You put all that together and playful learning landscape seemed like the natural way to do what we call guided play, which is that play in the middle allowing the kids to be the agent of their own learning in a richly based environment. And there you've sort of cut it in half, and you said we can do both. Fantastic. So another sort of follow-up question for you about why... So that explains the sort of why Playful Learning Landscapes, as it's structured and designed, gets to the guide to play and the outcomes you want. T could you tell us a little bit about why changing caregiver-child interaction is so important, and how does Playful Learning Landscapes do that exactly? Yeah, absolutely, and I, I'm going to use an example to help out here because I think it, it makes it so clear. Let's take reading. What we often do to enhance reading is we go after phonics right away, and we teach lists of vocabulary words. Think SAT. Remember when you sat down and learned the word syzygy? Never to be remembered again. Okay. <laughs> now... I, I never learned that word. <laughs> <laughs> you can look it up later. All right. So anyway, uh, the, the problem with that is that it doesn't stick. 
And when it doesn't stick, it doesn't transfer. And when we look at learning in the scientific literature, we look for stickiness and we look for transfer. So the question was, how do you learn to read? Well, it turns out in learning to read, you kind of start with communication. And when you have, I'm sorry, with collaboration and relationships. And with those relationships, you start to get a back and forth. In fact, the scientific evidence that's growing on these relationships and the importance of the back and forth dynamic, many of you have probably heard of this as serve and return, um, but we, kind of, we call it a conversation duet, a conversational duet because it's serve and return and return and return and return, that it actually creates brain structure. All right? And when you know that, then you're building the communication of language. So collaboration of relationships builds communication. If you have strong language skills, then you're not learning isolated words for an SAT test. You're learning them in context. And when you learn them in context, you actually hold on to them and you have a rich knowledge base so that when you learn those words, they make sense. And that way, you're going to become a real reader because the reading is based on something. So even something as simple as reading works that way. But there's tons of evidence now. In fact, a recent report that just came out from Kim Noble's lab shows that the gap that we have seen in reading over the years can be fully accounted for. Imagine this, fully accounted for by the kinds of conversations you had with your family so many years before. Unbelievable. And that's why the nudging, and some people think of, uh, when I describe this to them, if say, oh, it's like behavioral economics, like it's a nudging, but that's why placing a design of a physical environment nudges this d sort of increased quantity and quality of language. That's exactly right. And that's right. why it's important. Okay. Right, and, and I just want to say that you can target it. So if we put things out in the environment that is more STEM-like, science, technology, engineering, and math, what do we get? STEM language. What do we know? If you use more STEM language, then go on a few years, and the research tells us that prepares you for school readiness. Okay, great. I want to turn to you, Joan and Greg. Um, now that we have sort of a better understanding of like how this actually works, um, can you bring us up a level and... Tell us, because both of you have done quite a bit of programmatic initiatives across jurisdictions, how does this Playful Learning Landscapes initiative fit in with you know, the range of other types of child-friendly um, initiatives at community level that's happening? Great. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, it's great to see everyone here, so many friends. Um, I want to thank you first and your whole team for shining a spotlight on not just the 20%, but the 80% of time when children are learning. I wanted to reinforce that concept. It's what we call surround sound learning because you're learning all the time and those concepts are being reinforced. And Kathy, uh, thank you so much for the words guided play and the research that you're doing. When I entered the field many years ago, as you noted, um, there was this big debate between play and direct instruction. I thought it was over. And then a few years ago, just like two years ago, a reporter called me and said, what's your position on play versus academics? And I thought, here we are again. Um, and I think what, this, what you're doing here is really finding that middle that it's not either or, that ch children are learning all the time, and that it affects their development holistically. I wondered what people wrote about what you learned when you were playing, from me, I was climbing trees, I learned independence, I learned initiative, and um, I think those, those social skills, those emotional skills really um, stayed with me. I, I also just want to note the importance of caregiver-child interaction. How many of us have been on the playground with our child when they say, Mommy, look at me, or Daddy, look at me? That's an amazing opportunity for us to reinforce how important they are, how to respond to what they're doing, and to really be intentional about extending that learning. So I just wanted to reinforce some of those concepts. Turn into the community, and Greg and I have spent a lot of time talking about this. We both work a lot with communities. What I'm seeing across the United States is just amazing. 
the great work is happening at the local level, whether you're in Alameda County or in Onondaga County, whether you're in Palm Beach or Lincoln, Nebraska or Detroit, Michigan, or whether you're in Siaya County, Kenya or Bogota, Colombia. There is a movement happening where people are coming together and saying, how can we be the best place to raise a child? And how can we look at how children are learning and how they're doing, how they're developing at birth, at three, at five, and then eventually how they're doing in the early grades of school and beyond. What's exciting to me about playful learning landscapes is that we need to enjoin it with that movement that's already going on at the community level. And because it does two things. One, when you have what you saw in Philadelphia, it, it's a metaphor for what's going on in the community and how they care for young children. It brings people's attention to the needs of young children and how they learn. Secondly, and this is the advocate speaking, it brings on new champions, architects, urban designers, people that think differently than the traditional early childhood people. And together, I think they can be champions for young children, and that's what we want. Great. Greg, thoughts? First, I feel so lucky to be here. I feel like I'm amongst um, and between three luminaries, all of whom just gave us a master class. So if, if anyone ever has felt imposter syndrome... Um, oh, sort of. get over it. You are fine. <laughs> so um, I come from the other side of the state in Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh, which is Fred Rogers' hometown. And Fred Rogers taught us and his legacy remind, uh, reminds us that play is the real work of childhood. Pittsburgh is a place we like to call Kidsburg and have that aspiration to be one of the best places on planet Earth to be a kid and made easier to be a parent. And um, when I think about the playful design of playful learning spaces, I think about moments. How many of you have a child or have a child in your life? And um, you think about the moments in those kids' lives. Think of birthdays. Kids talk about their birthdays about 11 months in advance of their next birthday. Well, think about these playful learning spaces. They create moments. They create remarkably special moments for kids together with an, a parent a, a, or an adult, um, that makes learning visible. It makes learning visible and playful and joyful at a bus stop, at a supermarket, at a crosswalk, in a museum, in a library. And that expression, that public expression, is a public expression of our commitment to kids. It's why, Helen, I love that quotation from um, the mayor in South America, that kids are sort of an ind indicator spe species, right? Because if we create an environment and an environment drives a behavior of a commitment to kids and that learning happens anytime, any place. Well, that happens in our schools, it happens in our museums, and it happens in our libraries, but it happens in our public spaces. And if we take the moments to design those public spaces that create those moments for an adult and a child, then we have um, made that commitment to children and youth in the way that we need to. And I have a follow-up question for you, Greg, and then also, Joan, I'd like you to pitch in. I mean, I teased you a moment ago. To be, don't be silly. You absolutely belong here, in part because I want to pivot to the policy realm, which is where you've been an absolute leader, particularly in Pittsburgh and in the surrounding jurisdictions. So if we think this is a good idea, if we think this really is going to help young people, you know, how do we get more attention, get communities to start focusing on the other 80%, not, not in any way to say don't keep focusing on the schools, but like how do we galvanize that other 80%? What types of policies do we need? What types of public campaigns do we need? You've really done that. Can you tell us what have been the big strategies? What have been your lessons learned? And then, Joan, I'd be interested to hear your perspective also. Well, I think the playful learning landscapes happens in a place where we do the unsexy work of a lot of systems building. So when I think about Pittsburgh, when I think about Kidsburg, there's been decades of work of building a quality early learning system, decades of work of building an out-of-school time system, looking to Boston, Providence, other cities as an example, decades of building a mentoring system. In the past 15 years, we've built a network called Remake Learning, which is a network of more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, creative industries, higher education, thinking about and collectively working on what is relevant, what is engaging, what is joyful, what is equitable as we think about creating a learning environment in all the places where kids learn. People like to say learning anywhere, anytime, and any pace. 
Um, and so if it's that, quite frankly, it's the year in, year out work that happens in building a community of relationships among adults who are then positioned because they're superintendents, because they're architects, because they're designers, because they're librarians, to think about learning experiences, whether it's a space or a curriculum or professional learning, to think differently about how we're supporting and, and um, capturing learning opportunities for young people. And some people might not know about Remake Learning. Can you just describe it? And perhaps your Remake Learning Weeks and, you know, whatever features of it you want to describe. I appreciate that. So, yeah. um, so it is this 15-year-old network. So what is Remake Learning? If you're a school superintendent or you're a librarian, there are grants you can apply to. There are meetups every month. There are conference delegations. We just took 20 superintendents to San Diego. There'll be 67 people going to South by Southwest in Austin next month. It's, it's, it creates a community of adults who have access to communications, resources, et cetera, to create these learning environments. Now, it serves educators and practitioners. And so we've worked hard to say, how do we connect with parents, families, and caregivers and help them understand the importance of the learning sciences and how, this lear how the learning sciences are built into these learning environments? And if, in fact, my kid is lit up by playful learning or by making or technology-enhanced learning, how do I support my child? So five years ago, I launched something called Remake Learning Days. It's a lot like the ultimate block party that is featured well in the Philadelphia report. Taking a region and thinking of it as a learning campus, there are more than 250 events over the course of nine days in Pittsburgh during which parents, families, and caregivers can experience how learning is being remade and how to support their child in these contemporary um, learning moments and environments. And this work has now spread such that 15 cities across America, from Washington, D.C. to San Diego, will be hosting Remake Learning Days uh, this upcoming late April and May. Great. So, Joan, I want to go to you, particularly if you could lean in a bit on the policy angle, um, uh, on sort of like how, we, how can we get this movement going? How do we shift the attention? How do we help scale some of these approaches? Um, and then as a heads up to the audience, after, after we um, get wisdom from Joan, we'll, we'll go to the floor with some Q&A. Well, I think the, the wisdom is already in the communities. Um, I, you know, there is a movement out there to focus on, at least on the young children's side. I think what you're talking about is going on in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, something about Pennsylvania. Um, I think is happening. We need playful policymakers, I think. And I, this is an area that I think they can get excited about. Um, that may be more playful and joyful and therefore lead to policy change. That's, I think, our hope. Um, but we have to be intentional about it. We have to get them involved. But we have to get parents involved. And I think what you're doing to involve parents in the simplest way to help design, create, and react to what we're, the urban planners are doing, I think is going to be critical to changing policy. Um, as you uh, mentioned, I've been in the field for many decades, I, but I am really um, now focused more and more on, on the resources that we need to really deliver on the promise that we've made to young children that we will be encouraging them um, at the early years so that they have a lifelong trajectory of health, learning, and behavior. But we're not going to do that without enough resources. And that is the key policy issue, I think, of the day. Early childhood has been financed from the federal level and the state level. We're starting to get more local resources. This is a way to make it visible and to make those needs more, uh, more apparent. And I know, give us just a smattering before we go to the audience. I know that there's lots of issues that help children thrive in communities. Um, and this is, you know, a particular approach that can, that can really help their development and well-being. But what are some of the other issues we've talked about? Well, sending them out to play when there's ter terrible air to breathe, that isn't a good recipe. So, you know, what are some of the other issues and how do you think we should approach sort of this broader collaboration? I think we have to address these issues systemically and that means children have a right to play, but they have a right to play in clean air in fresh air. And what we're seeing around the world is exactly the opposite. When you have to test the quality of the air before you'll even let your children 
outside, when you can't drink the water in, in your own home. So we have to enjoin this issue of playful learning with an environmental movement, with a need for public housing, all the things that affect um, young children holistically, because this alone won't do it. It's more complex than that. Great. So let's go to some questions. We have a question right here. Two questions. We'll take these two and then uh, come back to the panel and then take another set. And please do introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Loretta Goodwin. I'm with the American Youth Policy Forum here in D.C. Two quick questions uh, for Kathy. I wonder if you can talk a little about student voice and listening to the young people. And I know you're primarily dealing with probably younger kids, but uh, just a little bit more about how we're actually hearing from them what they need. And then on the policy side, what we do is put together learning events for policymakers, take them around and show them innovative practices. So I'm curious when you say playful policymakers, uh, can you talk a little bit about ways that you think that we can get to that and showcasing for them? Because I'd be interested in having more of a conversation with you about that. Wonderful. Thanks. So um, a question for Kathy and then a question around how to create playful policymakers. There's in the back here with the red sweater. Yes. Good morning. My name is Karima Ahmed. I am with Goddard Systems. Um, my question is for Joan surrounding policy. So it's awesome to want to create fun policymakers or playful policymakers, but what areas of funding do you suggest that advocates target um, when reaching for dollars to fund playful learning landscapes? All right. Kathy, let's start with you, and we'll go straight down the panel. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for asking your question. Um, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing in playful learning landscapes is getting community voices. And those voices are really the whole gambit. Um, we first visit the community and say, what is it you're looking for? And we got pretty clear answers from community members. They wanted a place that was safe. They wanted a place that was beautiful. They asked us if it was possible to do something where their children might want to stay in their neighborhood as opposed to flee it. So we pull together from what they suggested. I mean, the science is as the science is. So, But we can adapt that. It can look like anything, and it can fit any cultural niche. And that's what's so exciting about playful learning landscapes. It doesn't have just one cookie-cutter form or shape. It really is adaptable. Parkopolis, for example, is, is, is in Spanish as well as in English. And in Philadelphia, I think, what is it, 13% of our population is now Latino. So we're very conscious of that. And um, these members of the community showed up, and I'm telling you really, everyone. We had teenagers. We had older people in the community. We had younger kids in the community that showed up at our community meeting, and they gave us ideas about how to tweak what we were doing and even made suggestions about how we could do it better. I loved that. And, and we listened to them and we heard them. So, um, so it's built into the design of how we move forward. And I know in the Playful Learning Action Network that we're putting together to try to reach out to communities, um, that's, a, that's a core feature. The second is that one of the projects that we did in Philadelphia was also called Play Streets, and we did it um, with the school system as, as well. And um, it was amazing. It was with teenagers who were working with young kids. Now, you might wonder, oh, my God, recipe for disaster, right? No. The teens loved playing, and we actually put them through training, just like you would a camp counselor, okay? So these teens came to our training. They learned how to engage in playful learning. Did they do it perfectly? Probably not. But at least they had the training, and they felt like they had agency and worth 
over the summer with kids. It occupied their time and it occupied the kids' time. And there was some place to go. So it's one of the core features. Great. Thanks. Joan, question on policy. Thinking about how you're bringing the generation, the generations together, teens working on behalf of young children, giving them voice. I think that's all part of the policy making. Yeah, I'd like to see more intergenerational linkages. We've got a lot of elder care who need also to be ha- be part of this playful learning. So, you know, I think it's bringing people together. Politicians come where people come. And so if you've got a gathering like that, it attracts, I think, the interest of policymakers. But honestly, I think it's a twofer. It's not only the children are learning, interacting with caregivers, but it's a portal to other issues. It's a doorway to talk about the fact that we need resources for better programming, for caregiver salaries, for better health care for children. So... To me, it's both something for children, something for parents and families and communities, but a doorway to larger issues that also need to be talked about. All right. How, how do we get playful policymakers? This is what everyone wants to know, Greg. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so Kidsburg is also home to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and we have stolen all sorts of ideas from Philadelphia and AYPF. And look, it's tried and true community organizing, right? Putting together publications like if kids build a city, and making sure those are widely distributed at Institute of Politic events held at the University of Pittsburgh or through the Pittsburgh Business Times. It's um, uh, during Remake Learning Days, mapping out the events by legislative district, and then organizing special tours for staff and policymakers to go see these spaces and places and experiences. It's a lot of just tried and true community organizing. And when we think about Remake Learning Days, Yes, part of the goal is about supporting parents, families, and caregivers and helping them understand how they can support the children in their their lives. But it's also about building parent demand. So when those parents go to a school board meeting or a meeting with legislators or writing op-eds or letters to the editor, they're asking questions like, why don't we have this in our neighborhood? Well, couldn't we think about this differently? And the exact money You go to the Department of Public Works. You go to Parks and Rec. You think about those human services contracts with out-of-school time organizations. There are all sorts of creative ways to use existing public dollars to say nothing of corporate or philanthropic dollars to make these things happen. Before we turn back to the audience for a question or two, uh, Joan, you're a former policymaker. Is that... Were those all the strategies you needed? Do you have other strategies? You're, you're, you come prepackaged to be playful. We know that. But <laughs> what other strategies would work on you or your colleagues? You know, I, I think that what Greg said about making these things visible so that other neighborhoods see, see and get interested in that. I think the more we talk about it, the more we showcase other cities and other communities, and I would say rural areas as well as cities, um, I think that helps build a movement, and it takes time, um, and it takes persistence, and it takes a bringing people together. This is a bipartisan issue, and I'm hoping that at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level, this is something that we can all rally behind, and it's a unifying movement for the country. Yes, Kathy. Can I just add one yeah. quick thing, which is um, there's another piece to this, I think, which is that a lot of people want to be playful, but they're kind of afraid. And they don't see or know about the links between play and learning. So in New Hampshire, they just passed a bill that all kindergartens next year must be playful learning kindergartens. Go New Hampshire. And that's because they finally saw the links between playful learning and outcomes. And it's that kind of stuff that also makes a difference. And just to do a quick double down on that, because your question about how do we get policymakers to see this, one of the 
in one of the uh, big research initiatives we have here at the Center for Universal Education is really about the science of scaling proven ideas. Um, and there's a whole bunch of research we've done around how to things that have been effective at that. And we have this list of kind of 14 ingredients that more or less are, are key. Um, and one of them is good use of evidence. And what we have found is that very rigorous evidence is useful for the practitioners. We need to know what works, what doesn't work in design. It actually doesn't make always that big a difference for policymakers. The thing that you often gets them turned on is going, visiting, seeing for themselves, and getting involved in an activity where they are they too learn through experiential learning. And they start, you know, doing a playful learning exercise and people are pointing out to them how kids are learning. We found that that type of experiential learning is a different type of evidence, but equally powerful. Um, all right, questions. We have one here. Okay, if you can be very rapid, we'll go one, two, three, four, five, and we'll have one minute responses from everybody. So, Michael, short. Yarlin, I'm a pediatrician. I just want to emphasize the importance of playful learning in mitigating stress. Stress is such a talk about a thing that's going to drive policymakers. There's a mental health crisis in this country when we have a high suicide rate in 10 and 11 year olds and play is one of the best antidotes to, to this kind of huge stress in our society. Right. Thank you. You are a model citizen for question. Yeah. So we have one, two, we've, we're going to get everybody. You just have to be really brief. Hi, my name is Kamsi McAdams, and I'm a mother of a toddler here in D.C., and I'm also the global director for STEM curriculum at Discovery Education. So personally, I want to know if there's any efforts going on in D.C. Mm. that you could tell us about. And professionally, I build um, curriculum for the country of Egypt, so I'm wondering whether there's any efforts happening in the MENA region that you could share about, and if not, quickly in a panel, maybe afterwards. Absolutely. Maybe. Great idea. And then we had, yes, the middle, and then the last one here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve Preston. I'm with the Parks and People Foundation in Baltimore. And, um, you know, it's no, no new news that Baltimore had the most violent year last year on record. Um, one question I have for you is, have you seen this work help reduce violence in your cities, particularly mm. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh? I think Baltimore and, and Philadelphia are pretty comparable um, because ultimately, um, Greg, you talked about asking Rec and Parks. Our Rec and Parks budget 60% of what it was 50 years ago, and now we have to cut it five more percent uh, to meet the Kerwin mm. Commission. So it's hard to tell policymakers about this stuff, even though I think it's a great idea with um, you know, sort of violence at the top of everyone's mind. Anxiety, violence, global. Yes, please. Uh, have anyone involved police in the communities? Mm. I think that's an untapped resource for four or five different uh, reasons. Great. So um, one minute, both answering the question and then any closing thoughts. Uh, we'll start this way. Greg, you first, and we'll go the other way. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I think about what you just said about the environment. My Pittsburgh colleague, Bill Strickland, says all the time, environment drives behavior. Look, there are ultimately 97 solutions to the types of things that we're discussing here. But creating that built environment that contributes to a sensibility about the types of investments, the types of behaviors, the types of experiences we need to create for children and their parents, families, and caregivers is something that will then contribute. And I don't, I don't know that I can draw a straight line between this work and violence reduction. I, I even, I'm not a social scientist. If I pretended to be one, I think that would be dangerous. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I do know, and I know enough from uh, qualitative and quantitative research that it contributes to an environment that is fundamentally different and suggests different types of investments in places like DC or Egypt that I'll defer to my other colleagues about. Great, thank you, Joan. Well, I want to also um, reinforce what you said, Michael, about stress. I mean, one of the more upsetting things that I see happening across the country is when they're reducing outside playtime for children in the early grades, which is the exact opposite of what they should be doing. So I'm heartened by New Hampshire, but I think we have to send that message Children are stressed, even very young children we're seeing stressed, and this is part of the answer 
to reducing that stress level. We should have a conversation later about the Maine region, um, and we can talk more about interests there. And, um, you know, I think one of the points that you're bringing up about violence and violence reduction, too many guns in too many cities in the United States, is that this is a hopeful sign in those communities. Again, I don't know how direct the evidence is. I'll turn to Kathy for that. But this is a way to answer that. But we have to make those neighborhoods safe. Otherwise, parents aren't going to be willing to bring those, their children to play in these outside spaces. And so these bigger issues go hand in hand with this, including controlling the number of guns we have across the United States. Thank you, Joan. Okay, Kathy. Amen, One, Joan. <laughs> one minute. Okay. One minute. Word. Thank you, Michael Yagman. I just want to introduce him because he's the person who brought you the prescription for play that many of you might have heard of last year. So absolutely on stress reduction. I don't know of anything in D.C. or Egypt, but I will tell you that there's a lot of interest from around the country and around the world. I think there's maybe 10, 15 cities in the U.S. and maybe... 10 from around the world. We can talk later about what they are, but please talk to us. And on violence, uh, what we have right now in evidence is the proof of concept. What we need to do next, I think, is to try to get enough of these things in a neighborhood where you can show the dose and density. Um, I think another really exciting place to go next is to work in uh, child care centers so that you have sort of a central core and can put a number of these elements, and in low-income housing, where you can literally change the environment for people to make it a kinder, gentler environment. I will say this, though. Urban Thinkscape has now been up for two and a half years in an area of Philadelphia, which is a very poor city, as many of you know, um, in an area where you would normally see tons of graffiti, and it should have been ruined by now. But because of the community involvement, because the community owns this, not us, there's not a drop of graffiti anywhere, and the neighborhood is proud of it and wants to keep it going. That seems to me to be precisely what we need to do so that it can be repurposed for the people who help us think through what it should look like. And I love the idea of working with the police as well, Bear. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I would just say in, a, in final closing that from our where we sit at Brookings, which is sort of the bird's eye view, and we our role in all of this is to drive policy-related research, to map what's happening, to help bring people together, spark a movement, we're seeing that actually there's a growing ecosystem of organizations that our uh, communities can call, parks departments can call, you can call and ask about, you know, uh, we're doing curriculum in Egypt. Um, and some of them are existing organizations like the Project for Public Spaces and Kaboom and Urban 95 um, that are leaning in on, on the learning sciences and the playful learning landscape approaches and bringing them into their work. Some of them are new organizations like the one Kathy referenced, the Play Playful Learning Landscape Action Network, which is Action Network network, which is just getting going. So we're very encouraged that there's groups out there, a growing ecosystem that um, is developing. And we really um, look forward to having everyone stay in touch. Um, and lastly, Kathy, what was that vocabulary word and what does it mean? Am I the only one who has no idea? <laughs> Don't you want to know? I, I believe it's an alignment of planets or something like that. But the point is, you can learn it <laughs> we know the a point. million <laughs> times and you still forget it because it doesn't relate to anything. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.